going to another monitor minimum or something like that. They just don't know what's going on. Well, they're listening to tonight. <laughs> well, trust, I doubt that. I don't, think no, they, no. I don't think they care about this kind this of thing. This program is going to be listened to by a lot of people. Go ahead. Okay, so basically what's going on, though, is that we can think of this in extremely simplistic ways, of course. I mean, the graphics that we put up there are just illustrations just to give you the concept because the level of complexity is beyond our ability to picture. And if we threw in all of the magnetic windings and all of their uh, strange, you know, chaoticness, it would look very much like Medusa's hair kind of a thing, all these writhing magnetic snakes going everywhere. In any event, so they get to the point where there is um, a predictable lack of sunspots, and it's predictable because we won't have these magnetic arms being able to climb up past a certain degree of latitude on the sun, and that's where sunspots occur. And they won't be able to climb up because there's too many of these windings that are jam-packed from that degree of latitude uh, and forcing it down towards the equator. When this, when this happens, and you get into this lack of sunspot age, you know, and the chaotic sunspots, that is to say some that will just come up and then disappear in a matter of hours, or some that will come up and just be the most violent things ever, persist for a day or two, and then fade away inexplicably. When this occurs predictably, that's when we're getting close to the maximum level of these windings because the, the windings are now reaching into the equator. And at some point, they'll get to the point where it just can't take anymore, and a magnetic sphere will be created that will expand out basically like a giant EMP or a giant, giant magnetic uh, a wave or explosion coming out of the sun. It may even be so magnetically intense that it will be perceivable if you happen to be looking in the direction of the sun when it occurs uh, because it would just make that much of an impact on your retina that it would trigger it as though it had been firing off on photons. And what speed will that emit from the sun itself? How long do we have to duck? <laughs> Well, there's there's the thing. Um, uh, light takes eight and a half minutes from the sun. This, right. this can be presumed to be close to the speed of light because uh -huh. of the level of pressure that's going on is actually starting to distort light. Uh -huh. So, so it wouldn't surprise me if it took you know seven minutes or something uh -huh. along those lines and just slightly uh -huh. superluminal, slightly faster than the speed of light. And the magnetic bow wave, if we could see it coming, ought to be rather spectacular. It ought to cause the you know a constant state of aura, or rather. Um, um, Aurora Borealis, the northern lights around the whole globe simultaneously. Big show, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it'll be frying satellites and pushing, you know, anything uh, at remotely magnetic into the atmosphere if it's between us and the sun. So mm -hmm. that'll be quite, quite spectacular. And it would account for all of the strange effects and all of the legends and all the prophecies about, you know, the, uh, the, the really bizarre things that our sun is capable of doing. Okay, let me back up just, to, just sure. a bit. Hold that thought, please. We'll go back to the windings. They're so tight, they're so chaotic, they have just crushed that sphere basically with this energy and the sun can't breathe. So it's going to throw all this off in a big, not a CME, but, well, a I guess... A CME would, might be sucked along behind it. Got it. it. Yeah. yeah. That would be secondary. So it's going to throw all this, this huge magnetic flux out, not necessarily in a, in a uniform... 360 degree fully spherical emission it could go correct and and the intensity will vary widely depending on got it how it happens to stuff it in which direction and in uh, what kind of pressure is behind it so correct. the question is is the earth going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time exactly that is precisely the question and actually we've had it answered for us by innumerable past civilizations that say yep yep you know we're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and this has happened at least three times in the last 40,000 years. What kind of a routine, time-wise, how, how regular is this recurrence? Between uh, 11,500 years and 11,800 some odd years, and the variance can be plotted based on what happens to the orbit each time. So well, that suggests... You know, Self-referential, it makes sense. I see. I see, I see. That suggests that most of the solar system is going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right? That's pretty routine for somebody to be standing with his chin out, waiting to take a heavy shot. Um, all right, well, there you get the basics of it. We'll come back and, and refine this a little bit more. Mr. Gerald, of course, talks about very few safe places to be on the planet, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Back in a flash. Been building for you know, 11,500 years. years. All right. And the Mayans and the knew it varies the between 11,500 and some other number, uh, and also the reason that the precession of the age.
ages has, has varied is because that every time it does this, it perturbs the orbits of the planets, thus shuffling them around a little bit, ourselves included, which alters our precession and so on, and slightly alters the uh, uh, level of accumulated um, angular momentum. So the sunspot cycle between each of these episodes varies ever so slightly, slightly. But the general, in the in the end of it, it always comes back to these specific fractional part numbers that are the real key important parts relative to the uh, solar, uh, to the equatorial and the and the polar spin. Something else that's really key is that it's not possible to observe the sun's uh, poles from Earth in a meaningful fashion and determine this 37 and some fractional part uh, of the day rotation. So the fact that the Mayans knew it either meant that space aliens came and told them or that that was inherited knowledge from a previous civilization that was at the uh, same level of understanding that we are. And so basically every 11,500 years it throws off this uh, energy, shuffles all the planets around, and since we're riding on one of those planets, we get shuffled around to a great degree, and this is what causes the pole uh, flips, both magnetic as well as crustal. And the mechanisms there are, are relatively understood, and it's also uh, likely, in my opinion, necessary in recharging the magnetosphere, which hmm. degrades over, curiously, about 12,000 years and mm -hmm. gets recharged every so wow. often. It also makes a lot of our... Um, Ancient history makes sense, and it also makes a lot of our current history make sense relative to why the powers that be are out there creating all these doomsday, doomsday seed vaults and trying to do all these... Um, well, not only are they are they creating a, the seed vault, especially the one in Norway, I believe, but Google is, is uh, digitizing every book, <laughs> yeah. with a few exceptions, every book on the planet. And then they're going to shoot it to the moon or something. So, I mean, these two things are kind of indicative of maybe somebody's planning for something they know is coming. Yeah, yeah. And they, you know, the powers that be, these various individuals have bought huge amounts of land in, in uh, very high places on the planet, as though they're worried about some event involving water. And that's a predictable part of a crustal shift. If indeed the, the mechanism whereby this would happen is that our magnetosphere is very weak at the moment, it has huge holes in it that have originated just in these last few years, and it was a weak before that. It's been degrading noticeably since the 40s and uh, was uh, was hugely degraded from the late 60s onward. We now have holes in it. And as the sun's um, pent-up tension in a magnetic bubble form is blown out from the sun, it will impact the Earth and shift our magnetosphere around. And the problem is the magnetosphere is so weak it won't resist. Yeah, may, couldn't it just blow it away and replace it with something new? or just, Well, it basically will do so. It'll charge it energetically. Supercharge it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but in the process, it'll flip the core of the Earth because Oops. the magnetosphere and the Earth, Earth's inner core are, are um, inter intimately and integrally mm -hmm. linked. Mm -hmm. What happens to one happens to the other. Mm -hmm. The Earth has lost 90% of its natural magnetic field in just the last four to five thousand years it's it's that's correct to, but we were already greatly reduced before it started getting to that level got yeah it. yeah and yeah, it recharges I, periodically and coincidentally to about twelve thousand years in terms of mm, the ice core evidence how but, mm. much data do we have to substantiate this geologically and other records of uh, of ancient history uh vast quantities too much to just sit here and talk about we could probably talk about it 16 18 hours and not even exhaust it wow I mean, that much. It depends on where you want to look and, and what specific level of what science, whether it's ocean science, atmospheric, you know, mm -hmm. geologic, mm -hmm. uh, archaeological, um, mythological, historical, linguistic, and it, it just goes on and on and on, and it just keeps piling on in these various, uh, actually rather elegant layers. The Mayans and the Egyptians were part of a society that wanted us to find this information out because it's going to come and happen to us, and they wanted to tell us. Yeah, well, attention. what are we supposed to do about it? Well, there's the there's the thing. The according to the um, uh, work that uh, Gerald cites, that goes to a Frenchman by the name of Flossman, who translated some hieroglyphics, and he includes the hieroglyphics in his book. So you can go and do the translation yourself if you want. And I have some hieroglyphic dictionaries I can recommend if you're interested. But in any event, uh, people in the past have survived. We know that people have survived past crustal shifts because we know that the crustal shifts have existed. We can find geological evidence of them, and yet here we are, and humans still continue to exist. In fact, there's a great number of us. So we know that this, that in spite of the um, level of chaos and, and 
problems of the past in these crustal shifts. Humans have pulled through and enough to carry the Yeah, even five percent will make it. We could we're like a virus. We don't need much. We got a petri dish called the carry the trade would probably be on the order of ten thousand breeding pairs. If That's it. Ten thousand. So if had 20,000 fertile individuals, you could probably make the species uh, reconnect. The problem is the level of civilization is mm. greatly diminished at that level. You right. need several hundred thousand to even come close to maintaining a, you know, a medieval level of civilization to start from. Hmm. So it's going to be rather difficult that way, and that is a real problem. That's what led me to all of this was why, pondering the question, given the nature of the creativity of humans, why have we not made that step in the in our uh, incredibly long span as a species, mm -hmm. why haven't we made it off of this, this rock? 